Here on YouTube, I have been classified as many- What the- What, you don't want me to do my long-winded YouTuber intro about how indie games aren't always as popular as AAA titles? Okay, I'll make it quick. Here on YouTube, I have been classified as many guys. Once upon a time, I was the League of Legends guy, then the Gotcha Games guy, the Sonic guy, and even the Nintendo-tainted individual, but one of my favorites has to be the Indie Games guy. But after making one, two, three videos on increasingly obscure titles, I was beginning to struggle with what defines an underrated game, because while a snarky comment or two may lead me to believe that everyone has heard of Lethal League or Sayonara Wild Hearts, the reality is quite the opposite. Just the other day, I was in the car with my friend and I said, so I was playing Pizza Tower and he said, what's that? And my brain went, oh shit, yeah, just because a game has 20,000 reviews on Steam doesn't mean all 7.8 billion people in the world have heard of it. So, uh... Y'all ready to get funky? Yes, I'll admit it, I'm jumping on the hype train a little bit. At first, I wasn't really sure if I had anything to say about Pizza Tower other than game good, but I'm not about to let this pizza leave the table without taking a slice for myself. I'm the indie games guy, and Pizza Tower is the kind of game that gets me excited to talk about video games. Pizza Tower is a 2D platformer with one of the most strikingly insane aesthetics I've ever seen in a video game. If most games carefully measure out a tablespoon of style sauce, Pizza Tower pours the entire fucking bowl into the mix on purpose. Like an MS Paint cartoon from the depths of hell, Pizza Tower's entire personality is fueled with adrenaline and oozing with creativity. Looking at Pizza Tower is like staring directly at the sun. It's almost painful, and yet it uses this aggressive design to loop back into something you just can't look away from, something you can't help but fall in love with mere seconds after seeing the opening cutscene. It ignores the fact that in some alternate universe, it could scare people away with its art style, instead using it as the main draw. In Pizza Tower, you play as Pepino Spaghetti, otherwise known as very fast Italian running at incredible high speed. When this motherfucker finds out his restaurant is at stake, he will start Stop at nothing to protect it. Except, uh, pay his debts. I don't think business is doing too hot. As you scale the tower to confront the dreaded pizza face before he fires a laser at the pizzeria, you'll encounter unique mechanics in every level to shake things up. You'll eat spicy chicken wings, get arrested, run through the forest as a giant rat, play Five Nights at Freddy's, fight the man responsible for holding up a Domino's in Shambly, Georgia in 1989, and war. War. This level changes a man. Anyway, wanna play golf with a big ball of cheese? After you're done exploring a level, whether that be gunning it for the end or carefully searching for every secret, you'll run into Big John. I'm not gonna explain what that means. Destroy him and pizza time begins, during which you must run all the way back through the level before the previously mentioned pizza face wakes up to catch you. Pizza time is such a chaotic and fun mechanic, giving the player time to internalize the layout of the level before shoving them back through it in a brand new way, as different doors and pathways open up on the dash back to the entrance. This is all apparently very Wario Land inspired, but I never played those games, so I'm uh, just gonna move on. You don't have to spend much time with Pizza Tower to notice just how much passion was poured into this game. There are tons of tiny references and easter eggs littered throughout each beautifully unique level, and Pepino has an absolutely insane amount of sprites, some of which won't even be noticed by a lot of players. He has unique animations for different attacks, running speeds, bumping into walls, using every level mechanic, and even unique idols like freezing in the refrigerator level, intense anger while holding a high combo, or accepting his inevitable demise when the escape timer hits zero. This man does not speak a single word, and yet he is portrayed on the constant verge of an emotional breakdown with more artistry than a fucking expressionist painting. So if it wasn't clear by simply looking at this game, it's about time I mentioned that Pizza Tower can often feel like anxiety incarnate. With its wacky ass art style, fast paced precision platforming, banging tunes, and the many screams of terror. 
This is not a chill game. My only real critique of Pizza Tower is more of a warning. This is a complex, high-speed platformer that doesn't ease you into things. The tutorial throws all of Pepino's mechanics at you right out of the gate, and it can feel pretty overwhelming. He can jump, grab, throw, uppercut, body slam, sprint, dive, slide, super jump, wall climb, and like 12 other things I'm probably forgetting. I had to go back to the tutorial several times during my playthrough because while trans people can double jump, Italians can quick sprint with a grab roll cancel and exit midair with a backwards grab input. Pepino's movement can feel quite clunky and slippery until you get used to things, and I spent the first few hours awkwardly slamming my head into every wall and enemy. Playing Pizza Tower once, casually, is like indulging in a painfully greasy pizza. You'll still have a great time, but you gotta take your time with it, lest you choke on the stuffed crust. At first, I could only play a level or two at a time before feeling a strange sense of exhaustion. I just couldn't understand what everyone saw in this game. I was too weak for the tower. But then, slowly but surely, I felt it. To truly appreciate all the ingredients, to understand why that specific pepperoni was placed 26 millimeters away from the sausage, you gotta get in the kitchen with Pepino himself. You gotta be the chef. You gotta go for the P ranks. <laughs> I consider myself a reasonable level of gamer. I beat Celeste Farewell, I thought the Path of Pain wasn't that bad, and I was really good at Rumbleverse. My friend can vouch. Yako is extremely good at Rumbleverse. Dude, I'm not reading this. So believe me when I say that P-ranking levels in Pizza Tower is not for the faint of heart. To earn these illustrious scores, you have to finish a level without dropping combo while simultaneously clearing all three secret rooms, grabbing the treasure, and running a second lap during pizza time. It took me over an hour to get a P-rank on the first level, and it doesn't get any easier from there. Even Pizza Granny will tell you it's a tough challenge, so don't feel bad if you don't want to do it. And this is coming from an NPC that normally just says shit like, KISS MY ASS. If you're a completionist, this game is a trip through the seven circles of hell and back. You will see, hear, taste, smell, and feel the grease as it seeps into your veins. You gotta merge the rat brain with the rat game. You become the rat. You see this rat? That's me. I'm, I'm him. I'm that rat. <laughs> I beat the whole game casually in around six hours, and it took me seven to get a P rank for every level on the first floor. I don't have ADHD, but I feel like I might develop it by the time I'm done here. These levels are some of the most intense and stressful platforming challenges I've ever played. Pizza Tower takes the route designing and fast reaction finesse of speed games to the extreme. While a game like Neon White has levels that average well under a minute, Pizza Tower forces you to perform affect 5 to 10 minute mazes of chaos. Dropping combo by missing a single jump several minutes in or getting killed by some dumb fuck snowman during the second lap reveals the true meaning of despair. But within each failure lies the game's greatest secret. With each and every attempt, the level slowly transforms from a wacky little platformer into a precision racetrack where every room becomes internalized and chained together. Taking a leisurely stroll through the tower is one thing, but as you open your third eye, slam on the gas, and start plowing through innocent pedestrians, the game feels brand new all over again, and every wall, enemy placement, and secret makes perfect sense exactly where it is. If I was a lesser man, I would have said something like, I wish I could prove my game gamer street cred, but with over 20 hours clocked in, I'm only halfway done. But I'm no lesser man. Did you really think I was gonna talk this highly of Pizza Tower and not procrastinate working on the video for several days in order to P-rank every level and earn every single achievement in the game? Can anyone explain how I'm still single? I can't say this type of pizza is for everyone, but if you like that beautiful build of tension where the sweat beads up on your forehead as you carefully pour the tomato sauce, your hands almost slip as you reach over to sprinkle just the right amount of cheese, arms shaking as you place every ingredient, and as your legs prepare to buckle, you desperately leap to put the pizza in the oven at the last goddamn second, and the tension releases. An infernal scream echoes from your soul, and you revel in the beauty of your piping hot pizza pie. Ah! 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 Oh! <laughs> wow. 
Let's go! Let's go! Yes! I did it! The search for online multiplayer games that don't make me want to put a bullet through my skull can often feel like a Sisyphean task. After the death of Rumbleverse, I desperately searched for something to play with my friends, something fun and replayable, and not a game where I get headshot after looting silently for 10 minutes. So after a few days, Fortnite was out of the picture. Then I played exactly two matches of Deceive Inc., a few hours of Divine Knockout, and unfortunately relapsed into League of Legends. Is it bad that I'm admitting that on record? Anyway, all this lead up is simply to say that I'm really glad Omega Strikers is back. It, it's League of Legends air hockey! Wait, no, don't go. N oh, shit. This analogy is not a joke. Omega Strikers is 3v3 MOBA inspired air hockey. Everyone uses a basic hit to knock a core around the field, and each character has three unique abilities to attack opponents, outplay the enemy team, or defend their own goal. And you can also do the bunt from Lethal League where you go dink and then you fucking. <laughs> While Omega Strikers may be trying its damnedest to weasel its way into esports territory, especially since the game is designed by former League and Teamfight Tactics developers, it's all done with a certain, wow, I'm actually having fun factor, as opposed to the usual, I'd rather chop my nuts off with a rusty kitchen knife factor also known as Valorant. It's kinda like a party game, but it's also competitive, like Lethal League. What do you mean only three people understand that comparison? Each character in Omega Strikers often specializes in a certain role. Estelle and Aimee can use their long-range projectiles to pressure the goal, X is an oppressive piece of shit who makes the lives of other players a nightmare by attacking them directly, and Dubu, the best character, is great at playing goalie thanks to his crowd control abilities and giant tofu wall. And he's very funny. There's a great sense of camaraderie that makes this game a joy to play with friends. You really have to communicate and work together to outsmart the enemy, carefully aiming your passes to teammates and chaining your abilities to stun opponents or score a goal. I was lucky enough to get invited to multiple playtests of Omega Strikers over the last year and a half, and it's been really cool to watch the game progress over time. As someone who only plays and reviews video games, it's always really exciting when I get the opportunity to talk to developers and learn more about how these wacky things actually get made. Plus, in one of the playtests, me and the boys were the top team on the leaderboards, and I will carry that incredibly minuscule amount of pride with me to the grave. I will say this, the game is fun enough that I told my mom I would be skipping dinner tonight, so that's huge. That's a pretty big deal. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> that's the high praise, man! <laughs> Even during the first alpha playtest back in 2021, when the map wasn't finished, character animations were still being blocked out, and you could barely see Dubu's stupid little head on the character select screen, this game was fun as hell. It didn't need any bells and whistles. I could have spent three hours running around as a placeholder model and it still would have been a blast. And I say this because I did. One of the characters was just the dead emote. Can we not all play as Among Us okay. characters, bro? What the hell? <laughs> I don't want to be Among Us. Oh, shit, I wasn't. Yeah, let's yes. fucking go! Yeah. Work in progress! Work in progress. <laughs> Yeah! We're crazy, we're crazy. An assist, baby! I'll take it. Okay, I really want to play character that I understand. I tell <laughs> Among us! Among oh us! God. Now, this is the part where things get a bit complicated. For the 30 or so hours I spent with the game in testing and beta, matches were first to five goals, win by two. This resulted in an average of five to 10 minute matches, which really fit the simple and frantic format of the game. Everyone would also equip passive buffs before each match, which had the potential to offer build variety, but often resulted in rigid best in slot selections. In the full release, of the game, Normal and Ranked are now a much longer best of five rounds, with each round being first to three goals. In between each round, you also spend 30 seconds drafting buffs from a random pool instead of equipping them beforehand. What all this leads to is matches that are three to four times longer. While these changes have proven to be somewhat controversial, I don't feel like I land on either side of being for or against them. Instead, I kind of realized that I can't see serious longevity in Omega Strikers, 
at least for me. The old format ended up making matches feel a bit too samey, as I only played about 5-10 to 10 hours of the public beta, but my gut reaction after spending time with the full release is that the new format feels like a mismatch too, an attempt to tap into the esports crowd and match complexity of other live service titles despite the game's inherent simplicity. The ability draft feels awkward since there's no real banning or counterpicking, and it's often hard to feel the passive buffs while you're still focused on the same two things, defend or score a goal. The best of five format also feels way too long for how intense each round is. In a game like League, you have crazy team fights, but there's also farming, respawn timers, buying items, and walking around the map. Features that pace out the energy so you don't have to operate at 100% the whole time. But in Omega Strikers, there is no downtime outside of the few seconds after a goal, and 15 to 25 minutes of near constant action and tension ends up feeling exhausting. While there's plenty of room for improvement and skill expression, and I do think there's a subset of players that will really love sinking their teeth into this game, I honestly don't know if I see myself dumping hundreds and hundreds of hours into it. I know that's basically an insult to a competitive live service game, but I do want to say that I've enjoyed just about every minute I've spent playing Omega Strikers, and I can tell the team behind it is super passionate. It's just that evaluating it on the merit of replayability gives it a much higher bar to clear than a funny little melee baseball game you spend 20 bucks on. Is it going to replace your favorite live service game for the next five years? Probably not, but Anime Pong with the boys is still pretty damn fun. Oh no, I shot on myself. <laughs> oh, 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 oh yeah. that was epic style. This is the one. Knocking in, knocking my ball. Oh my god, what a fucking play. Yeah, what a shit. play. There it is, there it is. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> you can also use a funny emote of my face in the game, so that makes it pretty good. If you walked up to me on the street and said the words heavy metal rhythm game FPS with dynamic music, I'd probably start foaming at the mouth. I mean, to be fair, I go feral for just about any game with adaptive music, but killing demons to the beat is pretty awesome. Metal Hellsinger is all about building up excitement and maintaining it at its peak. I am choosing my words carefully and this still sounds like a sex thing. Oh, maybe it is. The idea is simple. Kill every demon that gets in your way with an arsenal of pistols, shotguns, and more. But the catch? Both firing and reloading weapons needs to be performed to the beat of the music. Each gun fires at a different pace in a way that can be melded into the music. The dual pistols and crossbow can shoot on every beat, the daggers toss on two beats and take one to fly back, and the shotgun is slowed to every other, which changes the feel of combat based on where you fall in the rhythm. As you internalize the momentum of each weapon, Metal Hellsinger becomes a hypnotic experience, where you feel your body and soul blend into the increasing energy of each metal track as you slice and blast through hordes of enemies. Levels start out with a slow, thumping bass drum to get you acquainted with the song's tempo, before carefully adding more instruments and energy with every increase of the combo meter. At 2x, the drums and backing instruments kick in for real. At 4 and 8, bass and electric guitars get thrown into the mix. And when you hit that sweet, sweet 16, your birthday present is an incredible vocal performance from a cast of talented metal performers from bands like Dark Tranquility, Arch Enemy, and System of a Down. Every time that shit kicks in, Metal Hellsinger becomes the coolest game I've ever played, even if for just a few fleeting moments. The combo system is simple, yet works perfectly, forcing you to use fast aerial movement to jump and dash around enemies to avoid getting hit, which will lower the combo, while simultaneously requiring a constant level of precision and aggression to keep it alive. Reaching max combo isn't just for points, either. The longer you hold it, the more temporary perks you'll earn that can benefit you in combat, alongside boons you equip from beating challenges in between main levels. Even walking down hallways feels intense, since you have to keep firing shots to maintain combo outside of combat. 
The rhythm game never stops. My only complaint is that the difficulty settings felt kinda frustrating during my initial playthrough. Even when first starting out, the beast or hard difficulty felt like a perfect level of challenge for fighting regular enemies, but I quickly started getting one-shotted by the bullet hell-esque bosses. This wouldn't be a problem if I could, you know, respawn, but hard difficulty has the additional caveat of no retries, forcing me to play the whole game on normal to learn and clear the boss fights. Problem was, after getting used to the combat on hard for the first level or two, the rest of the game on normal ended up making most encounters feel too easy. Not a deal breaker by any means, but just something that kinda irked me considering there's an unlockable difficulty above Beast where the permadeath makes a bit more sense. That's about all I've got for Metal Hellsinger though. The first time I felt the sheer adrenaline of hitting max combo right as the chorus came around, I was sold. Oh, and if the heavy metal isn't heavy or metal enough for your tastes, you could always waste an hour modding in something like, I don't know, Sega Bass Fishing. Don't crash. Yes! <laughs> I remember this place like it was yesterday. While most of the games on this list came out fairly recently, Return of the Obra Dinn released back in 2018, but ever since I played it last year, I've been itching to feature it in a video. This is one of those beautiful, knowledge-based, you-can-only-play-it-once games, where you feel fantastically hollow on the inside after finishing it and can only rekindle the joy by forcing everyone you know to play it and experiencing the discovery again vicariously through them. In Obra Dinn, you have to assess the damages of a ship that has mysteriously returned after vanishing for insurance purposes. I know this sounds, uh, incredibly boring, but it's actually a mystery deduction game where you have to piece together a comprehensive log of every passenger, detailing their name and current status or cause of death. To do this, you use a magical pocket watch that allows you to view the final moments of various corpses around the ship. You're given the sounds and dialogue of each moment before being dropped into a frozen scene where you can walk around and investigate every detail. And these flashbacks aren't just like, oh heavens, I, Bungus Bonson, the ship's artist, have been shot with a pistol by Jimmy Jumbles. The fateful events of the Obra Dinn play out in a non-linear fashion, forcing you to carefully search surrounding areas, cross-reference previously viewed events, and pick out details like the language someone is speaking or the people they spend time around to narrow down their ethnicity or occupation. That, or you just say the captain killed everyone and get an achievement. I can't say or show much else without potentially spoiling Obra Dinn's magic, but everything about this game from the enthralling scene design to the immersive audio and unique two-color aesthetic has made it one of my new favorite indie games. Actually, no, what makes it one of my new favorites is when you get three fates correct and it locks them in and it goes boom. Boom, boom. But a boom, boom. But a boom, boom. Do do do. Boom. You get me? You know what I'm saying? Tunic is a game about the joy of discovery in its purest form, and in a similar fashion to Outer Wilds and Obra Dinn, it's a game I can't talk all that much about without spoiling its magic. Forget what you think you know about Tunic. It's not just a little isometric Zelda-looking game with a cute fox. It's much more than that. I know, just go and play it isn't exactly the hardest sell, but Tunic was one of my favorite games of 2022 for a reason, and I think anyone with an interest in puzzles, mysteries, or cool indie games should drop the 30 bucks and give this one a try. Oh, you still haven't bought it yet? Uh, what if I told you that Tunic is so good I bought the plushie? Come on, look. He's really cute. That's still not enough? 
Okay, fine. On paper, Tunic is an adventure game, but there are quite a few major twists. The main one being that the game's language is completely foreign, save for a few intentionally translated words and phrases. There's also no tutorial. Instead, as you explore, you'll find individual pages of the game's instruction manual, slowly revealing secrets about the world mechanics and controls. Everything hurts way more when I'm tired. Is this about the stamina bar or my mental health? <laughs> All of this evokes the feeling of wonder that comes with learning to play games as a kid. Instead of instantly revealing everything it has to offer, the game plays its hand very carefully, opting to withhold vital information to make its world feel delightfully mysterious. Yet at the same time, you're never meant to feel truly helpless. Every page of the instruction manual hides its own secrets, and while the pen markings scattered throughout could simply be a reference to the pre-looking-up-a-walk-through days of old, I think they're also meant to serve as a reminder that you're not alone. You're not the first to make this journey. Maybe in an alternate world you picked up a copy of Tunic at GameStop after the dude before you sold it back for like a dollar, and their successes and failures now exist to assist you on your own adventures. The way each piece slowly falls into place throughout the course of the game is just wonderful. A tightly chained series of intense combat, mind-blowing discoveries, and genius aha moments that repeatedly challenge everything you think you know about the game you're playing. As you immerse yourself in Tunic's rich atmosphere, the gorgeous sights, detailed sounds, and ethereal music, the world will whisper its secrets, and if you listen carefully, it may just help light the path ahead. Well, those really were five indie games you should check out. Hopefully they're enough to satiate your interests until I inevitably do another one of these compilations in the future. Subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and feel free to leave any recommendations for cool indie games in the comments. I'm always looking for new stuff to play. Uh, that's it. No ending joke. I can't think of one.